I'd like to join my welcome to Rachel's and have a special welcome to the, um, the small but brave number of male souls in the room who have joined <laughs> us this evening. <laughs> particularly, <laughs> particularly the two obstetricians, but also the other, um, the other men that I see sort of wandering around there. They're hiding in the back, but we'll ask really difficult questions later. It is with enormous pleasure, enormous genuine pleasure, that I introduce Professor, Professor Deborah Davis to you this evening as the first of our speakers in our inaugural professorial lecture series for 2012. This is an idea that uh, Rachel and I have talked about and I'm very pleased to see it come to fruition now. Deborah joined us a little over 12 months ago now, so she's had plenty of time to prepare this talk. And I do hope that it will be exceptionally good as a result. But no pressure, Deborah, as they say in the midwifery trade, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, this is a joint appointment, um, and I share the credit with Ronnie Croom, who's trying to ignore me over there. Uh, a joint appointment between ACT Health and the University of Canberra, the first of our co-funded clinical chairs. Uh, there's another such person in the room, but we'll wait for him, if it should be a him, to give us a talk at an appropriate time, and I will unveil him then. <laughs> the important thing about the clinical chairs in nursing and midwifery is that they demonstrate publicly our commitment to connecting real-world research and policy and practice. And the notes that I've had some help with talk about bridging the gap between the two. But I can't say that in this room with Helen Berry and Rachel Davey here because they will leap up from their chairs and hit me and tell you all that we try very hard at the University of Canberra in the Faculty of Health to do research that doesn't have a gap to start with. So we work between <laughs> policy, practice and research from the beginning. Once the gap is there and you have to bridge it, we think you're already a little bit behind the game. Sometimes it's an aspiration, but it's one we're proud of. To Deborah, Deborah has a number of research interests, including place of birth and how the environment impacts on the practice of midwifery, and the experiences and outcomes of women and their supporters. Her early career as a midwife focused on home birth, and she watched and learnt as women use different sorts of spaces within the home to labour and to give birth. She also noticed how the environment impacted on her practice as a midwife and the way she felt about childbirth and it's that theme that I think you'll see coming through today. Deborah will tell us that space is far from inert and it communicates something to us about childbirth and how this makes us feel and behave and it's a theme that I think will be increasingly picked up in the faculty in our broader research agendas. So a space born of what Deborah calls biomedicine and what we might, some of us who aren't midwives, think of as the modern obstetric hospital. Deborah put that explanation in for me in case I was confused. <laughs> it sets up childbirth as a potentially risky and fearful event and can be an environment <coughs> that communicates anxiety and stress to women, their families, to midwives and to those involved. Deborah's PhD was entitled The Politics of Practice, Case Learning Midwifery Practice in New Zealand. And this immediately made me as an old feminist, that is a feminist who's been a feminist for a long time, <laughs> think of the old slogan, the personal is political. And as I was thinking about it, I realised that nowhere is that more the case than in the process of giving birth and in the way in which we do it. And with four children, I claim some credit in that area. So. The key issue that Deborah explored in that thesis was the way in which case learning midwives in New Zealand constructed midwifery care within the obstetric hospital. The obstetric <coughs> hospital setting provides midwives with particular challenges as they work to create, maintain and protect the birthing space of the women in their care. Ultimately, midwives work to create a space for birthing that can be perhaps unique to each midwife woman pairing. Deborah's current work in this area includes examining the relationship between birth unit design and communication patterns. And here's those one, one of those wonderful, um, she's explained it to me as a postmodern term, emplaced midwifery practice. 
For those of you who are concerned, that would be kind of a combination of embedded and in a particular place. And she assures me it's something that Foucault would be proud of. <laughs> so, but it's a study of the way in which situation impacts on how we behave. So this project has taken place with colleagues at UTS in Sydney and later an international arm with midwifery workers in the, at the <coughs> University of the West of Scotland. And I'm sure that, that that's a nice visiting place, isn't it, Deborah? I'm sure we'll, we'll both have to go. So to conclude, in tonight's de uh, presentation, Deborah will argue that our maternity system is not offering the sort of care that facilitates normal birth, it is not kept up with research evidence, and is not aligned with the needs of maternity consumers, and will discuss the importance of standalone birth centres. There's some fighting words there, and I'm sure that she's going to back them up. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I felt myself sitting, um, getting comfortable there, uh, waiting for a really interesting kind of talk, and then realised I had to get up and actually <laughs> say something. <laughs> so, thank you um, all very much for coming. Um, it is a real priv privilege to be able to um, talk to you tonight. Thank you. There's my disc. Um, and to, yes, to be able to talk to you all about something that's um, obviously really dear to my heart. Um, and I'm really pleased too that midwifery has the distinction of being the first professorial lecture in the series. Um, and we've had a few firsts lately. Um, of course, we graduated our first um, graduates from the Bachelor of Midwifery program um, earlier in the year and awarded an honorary doctorate to our lovely Rajanthi Lipset. So we've been enjoying the limelight and, and um, quite like that. Um, I just want to start, uh, first of all, just by um, saying a few thanks because um, I, you know, we don't always have a platform like this um, to publicly acknowledge some of the people that really make a difference to you in your role and I, I want to spend a moment saying thank you. Um, you know, I, I am new to Canberra and uh, moved here a year ago and Canberra's had quite a bad rap in the, the media lately, <laughs> really sadly. Um, but I've just been welcomed from e absolutely every sector, um, really with open arms, and I, I want to thank everybody for that. Um, I, I think it's just a, a vibrant, optimistic, sophisticated city, and I really love living here. So thank you to the University of Canberra and the faculty for um, hosting us all tonight. This is um, a really lovely um, venue, and, and it's a great opportunity. Uh, my position, as Diane said, is a joint appointment, so um, as such I have two bosses um, at the university side, Mary Crookshank from the disciplines of midwifery and nursing tonight, I'm going to call it, <laughs> and um, Ronnie Croom with ACT Health, and of course having one boss can be bad enough, but, <laughs> but two could, could be a really terrible thing, but, but you <laughs> both work together to make this position work so well, and thank you for your support, I really appreciate it. Um, to my colleagues in uh, nursing and um, the wider faculty, um, I really enjoy the camaraderie there and the support that I get. Um, also, um, I just want to acknowledge as well the leadership team at Canberra Hospital and, and Liz Sharp, I don't think, is here at the moment, but in particular, you know, it's a really hard job and um, she's one of the best leaders that I've worked with in midwifery and I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. It's a really tough, tough job. Um, the lovely midwifery community, I mean the same faces turn up again and again at fundraisers, at uh, college meetings, at strategy meetings and um, all the events that you dream up to promote the profession and um, lobby for services for women and you know I just started to wonder whether you were just particularly hungry and coming for the canapes <laughs> and, the, and the wine or, or maybe you're just really generous amazing women, so thank you. Um, I'll embarrass my daughter now and say thank you for coming. <laughs> I'll just tell you how her attendance was negotiated. Um, you know, will you come to my seminar? <laughs> Is it going to be really long and boring? Yes. Are you going to rant about childbirth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there'll be free wine and canapes. Oh, I'll bring a friend. <laughs> So um, to Kalia and to her friends um, and the other young women out there, 
um, you know, our ranting, or what I like to call activism, um, is actually for you. We're really concerned to ensure that you have the opportunities to have the sort of birth experiences that we know are possible but fear are diminishing. Birth experiences that leave all concerned in, in absolute awe, that are inspiring, fulfilling and beautiful. And I'm not just talking about normal birth here because caesarean sections can be these sort of births for women too. So we want you to have birth experiences that leave you feeling like you are so powerful and so clever that you could do anything. Birth experiences that add something, that make you more than you were and that don't diminish you. Birth experiences that work like glue to strengthen the intimate <coughs> relationships and the place that you and your family, and place you and your family in the very best position for starting out um, on the huge challenge that's parenthood. And I just want to read you something from a blog um, that someone sent me that I think says it better than I can about why we do what we do. She says, um, some like watching people become a family right before your eyes. Some like being present when life enters and it takes its first big breaths. And don't get me wrong, both of those things can bring me to my knees in an instant. But that was never the reason that I did it. I could tell you about the logical reasons. I could tell you that I feel it's profoundly important for healthy mums and babies to have healthy low intervention births and that having skilled midwives and doulas makes it all the more likely. I could talk to you at length about how I think those low intervention births stack the deck for easier bonding, easier breastfeeding and dyads who bounce back from birth faster and with more joy and less work. And I swear to you, those things are absolutely true, but they still aren't why I love to be there. I do it because nothing else, nothing else compares to watching a woman move mountains with her own self. Watching her rise to a challenge and meet the moment with all she has. And that experience is only enhanced when she's supported by those who care for her. There is nobody out of the other side of that sort of strong birth who is not better prepared to meet the absolutely remarkable challenges of parenthood. When the power and trust is transferred to the mother, when she delivers her child rather than is delivered, and when she chooses rather than is allowed, no matter what sort of technical birth she has, she is stronger, fiercer and better. After a trip like that, you would kill for that child and you know you can. The miraculous moment when a woman owns the living daylights out of her own body and moves something incredible through it, it breaks my heart with the strength and dignity and bravery of it. So as Diane mentioned, I have been a midwife for over 20 years and do have a place, an interesting place of birth and birth environment. Um, when I went to study midwifery, my intention was to um, be a home birth midwife and, and I really don't know where that idea came from. It was a, a bit crazy, really. Um, I'd been uh, working as a nurse and had a really fulfilling career, in fact, in cardiothoracic intensive care. So I went from um, one you know, very different sort of environment and practice as a nurse to uh, something very different as a home birth midwife. Um, so I did go on to practice um, as a home birth midwife for seven years and then moved to New Zealand um, to take up a position um, teaching there. And while I was there, I did maintain a small caseload and I attempted to practice exclusively in home birth there as well, but um, everyone could have a home birth and lots of midwives practice home birth midwifery and there, so there wasn't enough uh, women for me to go around really to focus just on that. So. For the first time since I'd completed my midwifery education, I began supporting women um, back in the hospital setting. So I think, um, you know, it was just such a contrast to me and, and I think that experience, seeing um, not only how women behave differently in, in that environment, but, but how I felt really different in that environment. And in fact, my practice was different in, in that environment. And that was uh, really alarming to me. So it's this personal experience, really, that's driven my interest in this topic. So um, let's talk about childbirth, or let me rant about childbirth. Um, 
And I do want to start this presentation by emphasising that ACT Health, and I mean this, has an excellent maternity service. Better than most, in fact. Um, if you're having a, a baby in ACT, uh, you're in very good hands. Um, in the Canberra Hospital, your chances of avoiding an unnecessary caesarean section, um, we call them unnecessarians, <laughs> are in fact uh, much higher than in comparable tertiary units. There are many fine, well-qualified, skilled and really compassionate professionals who, who all work really hard to ensure women have the best outcomes in the ACT. So this uh, presentation isn't about criticising them. Um, it's not hospital bashing, it's not doctor bashing, you'll be pleased to know, <laughs> um, or any other sort of bashing, but it is about looking forward. Um, and I am going to be a bit critical, because there are things that we have known um, really for a very long time about the best way to provide maternity services to women, and um, I think maternity services have been too slow to respond. When I first went to New Zealand, um, because most midwives there are um, self-employed practitioners and they're just listed in the yellow pages like everybody else and um, I was so excited everywhere I went I, I tore out the pages of <laughs> midwifery to show people when I came home. So we've known for some time that continuity of midwifery we free led care and that's when one midwife or a small team of midwives provide care to a woman from early in her pregnancy uh, through her labour and birth and into the postnatal period. Um, so we know that that and home and home-like environments offer low-risk women the best opportunity for safe and satisfying normal birth. In fact they deliver superior outcomes um, on many counts when compared to traditional maternity services but these options still aren't widely available. Compared to other jurisdictions in, the ACT, in Australia, ACT actually fares relatively well, um, with an increasing proportion of women able to access continuity of care, and it's up to 37% now um, in Canberra Hospital, and that's phenomenal. It's one of the best, if not the best, um, rate in Australia. And everyone who, who worked to make that possible should be congratulated. Um, but the vast majority of services Australia-wide um, do not offer any continuity of care. And birth centres are also a rarity and increasingly so. Um, the Canberra Hospital, of course, does have a birth centre um, co-located um, just on a different floor um, to the uh, main birth suite. And the new maternity service will provide a vastly improved environment for birth, with most rooms having um, really lovely big uh, baths for water immersion in labour and birth. Um, thank you to those who fought <coughs> so hard to maintain a, a birth centre in the new unit as a separate entity um, to the main birthing suite, because I think that's absolutely critically important. And um, you'll see as we move through the presentation why I think that um, however, still in the ACT, over 200 women um, want a place in the birth centre every year and, and can't get it because of limited places. Um, and this is leading some Canberran women to quite desperate um, behaviours because we used to joke that, um, you know, as soon as you conceived, you had to get on the phone and ring up and book a place um, in the birth centre, otherwise you'd miss out. And, and now, in fact, some women are booking in um, before they're pregnant, trying to book in before they're pregnant with a, a phantom pregnancy. Um, so they're desperate. Some women are really desperate to get a place. So clearly, um, you know, we can, we can do a bit better. Um, normal birth is on the, the decline and caesarean section rates are increasing. Australia, um, I, I hope you can see that. Is, does that <coughs> kind of clear? Yep has one of the highest caesarean section rates in the OECD um, and it has almost doubled in the span of about 20, 25 years. Um, Canberra Hospital has one of the lowest caesarean section rates um, amongst comparable hospitals in Australia and New Zealand but these rates are increasing. And, and rates are useful and interesting but you know, if you break that down to actual numbers um, it's a little bit scary. So about 290,000 women give birth in um, Australia each year 
And if our caesarean section rate was as low as the Netherlands, which is you know, right down there, um, we'd have about 40,000 women having a caesarean section. But at our 2009 caesarean section rate, which was 31.5, we've got about 90, 91,000 women having caesarean sections. So that's 51,000 extra caesarean sections. And I don't know, check my maths, I had to keep doing it, but that's a lot every year. You know, that's, that's a, a, a woman having, um, you know, a surgical operation. So this many additional women are exposed to caesarean sections every year. So why do we care? Uh, perhaps caesarean section is just a new way and even a better way for the majority of women to give birth. So why don't we just go with the flow um, and give in to the inevitable, inexorable rise of um, intervention in childbirth? Well, that would make my life easier, definitely. Um, first of all, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tall order and it's actually pretty arrogant, I think, to think that we can do better. Um, as one midwife in a recent focus group reminded us, and she's probably even in this room, um, we're the most successful species on this planet, so clearly we've been doing something right. Um, historically, we've only been um, intervening in childbirth in this sort of technological way for the last one or two hundred years. You know, caesarean section um, is just... Uh, I think the first one was late 1800s or something. So it's quite a recent phenomenon in the, the scheme of things of mankind. Um, and prior to this, you know, the ancestry of, of every woman was really an unbroken line of successful births, mm -hmm. tracing back thousands of years. Um, otherwise, you, you wouldn't be here. So we've been very successful as a species. Um, and we, we can't give up um, because caesarean section isn't a better way to give birth. Not for all women. Um, there are the obvious risks of complications that accompany anaesthesia and surgery. Um, and caesarean section also brings additional risks to future pregnancies. These include uh, risks of malpresentation, placenta previa, so the placenta coming uh, before the baby. Um, antepartum haemorrhage, placenta accreta when the, the placenta's adhered um, to the uterus, uh, uterine rupture, preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirth. Um, of course, an operative birth also impacts on the postnatal period and the woman's ability to care for her baby. There are long-term potential consequences associated with such surgery and any abdominal surgeries in the future could be more complicated. So we've, you know, we've got quite a, a decent sized um, part of the population moving forward out of their 20s and 30s, um, already ha having had abdominal surgery, sometimes more than one. Um, and there could be significant morbidities associated with that. Into the long term, we don't, you know, oh, sorry, we don't know um, what might, that might bring for women 20, 30, 40 years into their futures. There are greater risks to the baby asso associated uh, with caesarean section, um, including respiratory problems and um, higher infant mortality, um, even when you remove the indications that led to the caesarean section in the first place. Um, in the longer term, birth by caesarean has been associated with increased risks of allergy, diabetes and leukaemia in later life. So I don't think we've even begun to realise the longer term consequences of such high caesarean section rates and these will be felt by individual women, their, their families, their babies, by our health services and our public purse. And this is the other reason, you know, we, we just can't give up on normal birth. And I, I don't make any apologies for wanting this for as many women as possible. It isn't just a moment in a woman's life, but it's something quite profound that can impact on her for the rest of her life. Um, and the same is true of the opposite of this. Those births that leave women feeling diminished or unimportant um, or even traumatised, and we know that um, those experiences stay with those women for the rest of their lives. 
So the promotion and protection of normal birth is important. And in this presentation, um, as Diane mentioned, I want to focus on birth and environment and its role in facilitating normal birth. And by environment, I am talking about the tangible, tangible environment, so that you know the things you can grab hold of and, and touch and see, the beds, the room layout, the signage, but also the intangible things that, that you can't touch, but nonetheless, they impact on our experiences. And I'll have a, a quick look at um, the environment from two perspectives. That of the woman, um, looking at the way the environment potentially impacts on her physiology in labour and also from the perspective of caregivers. So every Tuesday morning, um, as the midwives from Canberra will know, we have an, have an audit meeting um, where we do look at uh, all the births that are happening through the week. Um, usually not a lot of discussion about the straightforward births. We move on to the ones that are um, usually uh, a little bit more complicated and involve some intervention. And I have to say that sometimes, you know, there's very complex um, situations that are discussed there and, and I'm always really impressed with the, the knowledge and the expertise of a whole team that's obstetrics, midwifery, uh, neonatology, neonatal nurses, um, of everybody that, um, and the skills that they bring to those really complex situations. And, and I thank God for our hospital and the staff there and what we're able to achieve for those women. That's when obstetrics is at its best and we do it really, really well. Um, and there are other sort of situations that we discuss. And this is fictitious, but it's a, it's a typical sort of example. So, um, so the chair might say, okay, we've got Jan Smith, caesarean section on Friday afternoon, you know what happened there? Someone will say, oh, yeah, she came in and she wasn't contracting that well. Um, you know, we, we augmented her. She didn't really progress. Failure to progress. Then there was fetal distress. We might have a look at the CT trace. Everybody nods. Everybody's agreeing. Oh, yes, no, not a good trace. Um, so off to theatre, caesarean section, blood gas, not that great. You know, we're all in agreement. Yep, that, that needed to happen. Um, it was a good thing. She needed that caesarean section. Um, baby's fine, everyone nods, and we move on to the next, the next case. But I, I just want to backtrack and um, look at that situation in a, in a little bit more detail. So we've got Jan and Mark, great couple. <laughs> Having their first baby, healthy, well, excited, late 20s, nothing that remarkable about them. They quite like a normal birth, but you know, they ultimately they want what's best for the baby. Jan starts to get some mild contractions at home and Mark comes home from work to support her. They're, they're really excited, a bit nervous. They would really just love to head straight into the hospital because they're really sure this baby's gonna come any minute. <laughs> um, but they're instructed in their childbirth classes to wait until the contractions are five minutes apart. Um, and that's exactly what they do. Mark has a stopwatch, he's timing them with precision. <laughs> Finally, five minutes apart and they're out the door. So it's a nerve-wracking journey, of course. You know, they get every set of red lights. <laughs> Anx anxiety mounts. Jan has a contraction in the car, that's not much fun. Mark hopes her waters don't break in the car. <laughs> Finally, they turn into the hospital right behind a little old lady. She looks about 95, two miles an hour. It's one of the midwives on her way to work. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, they park the car, gather up their belongings and head into the hospital. Another contraction just as they're getting out of the car. The car bonnet is the perfect height. Mark's a little bit worried about the waxing and buffing <laughs> job. Um, into the hospital foyer. There's a long queue snaking out of the Hoz Express Cafe. <laughs> Desperate faces. Patients, <coughs> visitors, staff, some in scrubs. They're all bustling about the foyer. Someone's polishing the floor. Have you noticed someone is always polishing the floor? <laughs> it must be one of those never-ending jobs there. Jan's terrified the waters are going to break on the newly polished floor. <laughs> 
So they pass a big sign saying, stop infection and the hand disinfection station. Um, they pass some more signs saying, uh, director of emergency medicine, fire door, do not obstruct, staff only, do not enter, pharmacy, fire escape, emergency alarm, no access, pathology, specimen reception, doesn't even bear thinking about. And finally, breast is best. They've reached their destination, <laughs> eternity, <laughs> almost. Upstairs into the birth suite, scooch past the defibrillator, the sharps bin, the contaminated waste receptacle, um, to the haven that is their birth room. So, are you getting the picture? And I haven't even touched on the smells and the, and the sounds. Um, and so far, there's not been a lot about the environment that's um, working to reduce their anxiety. Um, it's not very warm and welcoming, um, except the lovely midwife that they meet. They haven't met her before, but she's really nice. Um, so the midwife asks some questions and starts filling out some paperwork, and Jan reports that her contractions are five minutes apart. Uh, Mark confirms this. He shows the <laughs> stopwatch. Um, but they have been in the birth suite now for a little while and Jan hasn't had any contractions. So, of course, they feel really stupid and embarrassed. Um, they were five minutes apart, you know, I promise. Uh, the midwife examines Jan and ruptures the membranes to help get things going. Um, she's got a couple of other women to look after, so she, she looks, uh, heads out of the room. And Mark looks at Jan, and, and Jan's starting to feel a bit like she's underperforming. She's, you know, a bit of a disappointment. Mm -hmm. uh, they, she settles into the bed. Um, there's nowhere else for her to go. Uh, has to be the bed. Uh, Mark is bored. He starts checking out the room, emergency buttons, theatre light, stirrups, <laughs> gas outlets. <laughs> he opens a cupboard to see what's inside. <laughs> Don't do that! <laughs> so it's not their space. Time passes, they hear voices outside the room, buzzers, trolleys clattering up and down the corridor, someone polishing the floor, <laughs> screaming from another room, a baby cry, well that's nice. Jan's contractions start to get strong and she starts to writhe around the bed in pain. They don't know what to do, she's frightened. Mark's even more frightened and he ventures very timidly into the corridor looking for help. He doesn't want to be a pain, but finally Jan's examined again. Still four centimetres. The contractions are not effective enough. The progress is too slow. She needs to be augmented. It's going to be a long haul. Do you want an epidural? Flurry of activity. It's had a cannula, syntocin and infusion commenced, epidural cited, blood pressure monitored. Baby now requires monitoring. Um, and after all that flurry, uh, Jan and Mark are silent and they're just mesmerised by the CTG and the trace slowly spilling out of the CTG machine. Hours pass. Jan's examined regularly, but she's failing to progress. The midwife checks the CTG, recording periodically, registrar's called, worried looks are exchanged and the baby's heart rate is a concern. A caesarean section is required. So this is the typical cascade of intervention um, that we often talk about. And in this situation, the very first intervention was moving Jan from home to hospital, from a, an environment that is familiar and comforting to one that's really not. Um, and if you even think about the sort of environment that you would provide um, to one of your pets, a pet cat that was in labour, um, you'd make sure there was a cosy, warm place available, usually somewhere familiar and protected, a small room, perhaps a laundry. Um, you'd try not to disturb her too much. You certainly wouldn't move her unless she was unsafe. Uh, you wouldn't shine bright lights in her face, expose her to lots of noise and activity or prod her. Uh, you wouldn't bring in the neighbours and their dog to watch. <laughs> and there have been a number of animal studies that have looked at um, the environment of birth. And um, one study in particular was of labouring mice and they moved them in labour to an environment that was impregnated with cat urine. And you could imagine what happened. Those mice went out of labour and um, the consequences for the, 
the, the pups, I don't know if you call them pups, do you, in mice? <laughs> was that the, there were a lot more of them were stillborn. So it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, of course, mothers want or need a safe and protected space to give birth. And I don't think that these sort of uh, environments are exactly that. So we, we respond physiologically and emotionally to our environments and environments that provoke fear and anxiety can have particular effects um, on our physiology. So you do release um, catecholamines um, when, when you're fearful um, and that has a dampening effect on oxytocin that reduces the um, uterine contractions and of course leads to that sort of inertia or failure to progress potentially. And um, when we spoke, I just spoke about Jan turning up to um, the delivery area and, and her contractions having stopped when they had been five minutes, I mean we all know that. Um, as midwives, that is exactly what happens and it takes some time for those contractions to re-establish again. Um, another issue with these sorts of environments is they don't invite or support the woman to be active in labour. And there are benefits to being active and upright in labour. Uh, labour pain is ameliorated by movement. Contractions are stimulated by increasing pressure on the cervix. And the baby's progress through the curve of the birth, birth canal um, can be assisted with movement. In addition, women don't have control over these environments. Um, they're really a spectacle, a uh, centre stage on, on the bed in that room. When she's in her own environment, um, often they make use of a variety of spaces uh, at home, for example. They might start early labour um, for instance, doing something familiar like making a cake or you know something to occupy themselves. I vacuumed my skirting boards because suddenly that <laughs> felt absolutely <laughs> important. Um, she might be sociable for a time, chatting between contractions um, in the living area and as labour grows more and more intense she might seek the privacy of other rooms and less stimulation, dimming the lights, um, even moving out um, of sight of her supporters. She might walk about during or between contractions and I once had a woman who spent her entire labour marching um, up and down her lounge room singing when the saints come marching in. <laughs> but you know that, that worked for her. Um, they might lean on kitchen benches and tables, try a shower, try a bath, sit on a chair. So they make use of a whole lot of spaces and props in labour and she's got control over her environment. environment. And I have to say, I've never known a woman to take to bed in labour at home, never. So the, the environment of birth not only impacts on the labouring woman but also on her caregivers. And when I first started supporting women, um, to give birth back in the hospital environment, I just feel, felt like I had all my tools taken out of my tool bag as a midwife. All those props that I mentioned earlier, the ability to take her for a walk around the block um, or around, around the backyard, fresh air, movement, it can just make all the difference to um, a, a labour that's hard and feels stale. The use of stairs to help a baby that's not well positioned move through that um, birth canal, the ability to decrease the environmental stimuli, to dim the lights, for her to move to a more private space. But it's more than that. Um, the environment communicates something to us about birth and it shapes the way we understand birth and therefore the way res we respond to childbirth. And the tertiary hospital constructs childbirth as a risky event. <laughs> It does, it screams <laughs> risk. <laughs> every sign, every piece of equipment, the room design, the decor, the communications, the interactions. Fear takes on a life of its own in this environment and, and risk is really blown out of all proportion. Mm. We focus on the things that don't go well in, in the audit meetings, in the uh, mortality and morbidity meetings, which is the purpose of them, but in the tea rooms, in the corridors, I mean, to our credit, we examine every detail of, of these situations and look for ways to do better. And it is often um, 
about doing more. You know, what more could we have done? Was it more screening, more monitoring, more action? It's never really in terms of um, what could we have done less. And we know in um, midwifery, in, in the words of Nikki Leap, um, sometimes the less we do, the more we give. So we are fearful, and our fear breeds fear. And this shapes the way we manage childbirth, and we do manage it. And the paradox is that our fearful actions can create the situations that we fear most. The intervention we employ in an attempt to safely manage birth can create the dysfunction or the distress that we're attempting to avoid. Um, and this all, of course, impacts on women's outcomes. Um, this was a study that I conducted in New Zealand. It was a retrospective cohort study with 16,000 uh, women, low-risk women, and all these women were in the care of midwives, so they were all having continuity of care. This is about us. Um, and we looked at a whole range of outcomes. This was um, one of the main ones, mode of birth. Um, and caesarean section rates were significantly higher in women planning to give birth in hospital compared to the same sort of low-risk women who plan to give birth at home or in birth centres. Um, so a tertiary hospital would be like Canberra and a secondary hospital would be uh, like Calvary um, in New Zealand. So their percentages, um, that's a massive difference. Um, a recent UK study, many of you will, will know it, um, it's probably the, the best evidence that we've got on place of birth. It was just published, uh, I think, towards the end of last year. It was a prospective cohort study. Um, we're never going to have a randomised control trial on this thing. We can't randomise women um, to have their babies at home or hospital. Um, so this is really uh, strong evidence from the UK. There was about 64,000 women in this study. So they've got uh, you know, a bit of a different categorisation. This is rates per 100 as well. Um, but again, you know, an 11% in labour caesarean section rate um, compared to, I don't know what it was, less than three probably oh, at home or, or the birth centres. Um, but what's interesting is having those two types of birth centres, so ones that are freestanding, which means they're not located with, on the same site as the tertiary hospital, and those that are alongside or co-located. So even there, there was a bit of a difference in the caesarean section um, rates. Um, so many of you will be saying, well, well, that's fine, but what about you know, the babies? What about the perinatal mortality and morbidity? And um, of course, our study, New Zealand study, wasn't big enough to be able to de detect differences um, in that, um, though the, the raw data um, there, there were no um, differences just on the, the numbers. Um, and this study found um, they had a composite outcome of um, different factors that created um, a composite, so mortality and a range of things associated with morbidity for the baby. Um, and the births, there were no differences in, in that outcome um, with the hospital and either of the different types of birth centres. Um, there was a difference in the home um, only in primates. So primiparous women um, had higher rates of perinatal mortality and morbidity as composite outcome at home, um, but multiparous women didn't. Um, so looking at this idea of the, the freestanding um, birth centre. Uh, Australia has a number of examples and New South Wales has two. Uh, one at Belmont, uh, which is sort of up near John Hunter, Newcastle Way. Um, it is situated in a hospital that offers um, a lot, but not obstetrics. So there's, you know, medicine, general surgery, uh, has some emergency services and a lot of different allied health. Um, but the service is networked very tightly with John Hunter Hospital. So women who um, and it's for low-risk women, so you know a number will be uh, weeded out, if we want to use that expression, antenatally, who don't end up being suitable. But in labour, if anybody requires transfer, they'll be transferred um, to John Hunter Hospital. And the other example is uh, the Ride Midwifery Group practice, and that similarly op operates out of a subacute hospital um, at Ride, and it's networked with the Royal North Shore
Um, so there is a lot of focus at the moment on home birth with the national maternity reforms and recent legislative changes. And um, obviously I wholeheartedly support um, women's right to choose their place of birth and certainly home birth being one of those options. Um, but for now it will be a choice of a minority. Um, lots of women are demanding continuity of midwifery led and birth centre care so I think that focusing our attention on developing this aspect of the maternity service in particular will benefit a great many more women. And wherever these sort of services off are offered in Australia, continuity of care and birth centre care, um, demand far, far ex exceeds what we can supply. So we've got some really good evidence that um, this package of care improves outcome and satisfaction for women yet they're not widely available. Um, in fact, if this package of care was a medication, um, we'd be scrambling to make sure that every woman was prescribed it. Um, every review into maternity services, and there have been a few in the last uh, 30 years, have recommended exactly the same thing. More midwifery-led models of care, more birth centres, uh, more continuity of care, and these options still aren't widely available. I'm talking uh, across Australia. So there has been, in my view, a systematic failure of our maternity service to respond to this evidence and respond to consumer demand. So in short, our maternity system has failed to progress. I think it's an ideal time to consider a freestanding birth centre in the ACT, uh, one that's uh, co-located with the proposed new subacute hospital and closely networked with the obstetric service and tertiary centre at Canberra Hospital. And it is a good time because our maternity service as a whole is robust and there's huge unmet consumer demand, especially from women in the northern suburbs. The new Women and Babies Maternity Hospital currently under construction, as I said, will provide an improved environment for birth. Um, and we're all looking forward to that, but we need more. Midwifery also needs a space where our special skills, and that is the ability to facilitate normal birth, where that can shine, and where our constructions of childbirth and midwifery, rather than its obstetric practice, can flourish. So this is an ideal time to progress midwifery services in the ACT. We need to provide a service that not only meets our current needs, but those of the future and midwifery-led continu continuity of care in home and home-like environments is that future. Thank you.